gone to the cloud. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. So Mina, I had one question. Please go ahead. So is it possible that you share the file? We have already uploaded it. Fantastic. Yes, yes, I'm sharing. Thank you. <clears throat> so we begin with uh, Mazen. Mazen, this is your presentation. I will keep time and when it's eight minutes, I'll send the chat and I'll also perhaps indicate uh, on the screen, but because you will be able to see me, maybe you can wrap it up in two minutes, okay? Thank you. Yes, sure, no worries. I don't think I'll take more than uh, eight to, to 10 minutes. So hi everyone, uh, it's good to, to see you all. Uh, I know there's some colleagues, some that we've worked uh, in the past together. My name is Mazen Ishra. I'm the Shelter and Wash Technical Advisor at Save the Children in Lebanon Country Office. And today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an innovative uh, initiative that we did in Lebanon in, in refugee camps. Just to put you in, in context, uh, Lebanon uh, consists of, uh, or the, the crisis, the Syrian crisis in Lebanon have uh, started in 2011. And since then, uh, plenty of uh, refugee camps, or what we call informal funded settlements, because the government does not want to uh, uh, formalize them, exist all over the country uh, in uh, an unorganized way. And this is what the humanitarian response is trying to do to organize uh, this context while, uh, while not providing a, a permanent solution, only a temporary solution, just to ensure because the government is putting restriction and limitation uh, not to keep uh, the refugees in Lebanon, but uh, support them to go back to their country. So uh, climate change, what's the link between the climate change and uh, the, the initiative that we have done in Lebanon? Those refugee camps are uh, subject to uh, several hazards and risks due to uh, the climate change. During summer, we're uh, encountering uh, hot weather, summer, and during winter, we have uh, extreme cold uh, weather and heavy snow and, and, and rains and, and winds. So the vulnerable communities are uh, tending to use uh, primitive uh, ways to heat their tank, either through using uh, the usage of candles or fuel stove, uh, or uh, through the usage of uh, uh, unsafe electrical wires to, to heat the water they are, uh, they are using. And during the hot summer, uh, which is uh, normal, and you can see that in all over the world, uh, the type of those shelters are uh, at higher risk of, uh, of, of coating fire because they are made of, of plastic. Can, can those who are not speaking, if they can mute, please? Yeah, so and during summer, uh, the material uh, from which the tents are built is subject to, they are, they are burned, so they are at risk of, uh, of coating fire because it's made of food and, and plastic sheets. So uh, next slide, please. So based on uh, our latest numbers between 2018 and uh, 2020, 400, more than 400 tents uh, got destroyed uh, because of fire. Uh, 31 uh, lives, unfortunately, uh, lost. Uh, including children. And uh, during the past 10 years, those refugee camps are becoming more and more uh, overcrowded and uh, the, uh, the safety measures are uh, less and less uh, uh, noticed. So you can see plenty of uh, tents and uh, uh, refugee tents made of plastic sheets and wood uh, near each other, which is a big hazard and, and risk to, uh, to catch fire. So what we are proposing, next slide please now, what we are proposing and started implementing uh, two to three years ago now is the uh, fire barrier solution. Next slide. We've tested it first in uh, on a, a dummy tank. We've built a tank and tested the uh, the prototype. It consists of uh, building a wall, and I will speak more technically on the uh, on the component of, of this wall. But the result of our testing uh, delayed the fire for 16 minutes. So between having a fire that is being caused from a tent to another uh, in a few seconds. Uh, the fire spread from one tent to the other went from a few seconds to 16 minutes uh, uh, in our uh, simulation. 
And it proved as well that uh, it has a better sound insulation, which is an added value because of the uh, context and uh, ensuring more and more privacy within the uh, informal settlements. Next slide. So the fire barrier consists of uh, material that uh, mainly are available in all of the market, nothing special, the marine plywood. Uh, which is a type of wood of uh, 50 millimeter thickness, a galvanized steel sheet, and I'll speak more in details how we're using them. The rock wool board density uh, with density 100 kilograms per meter cube, which is the uh, the soundproof. It is used mainly for uh, for soundproof in some of the uh, uh, some of the construction site. Timber and uh, black silicon to avoid any uh, leakage of water and uh, plastic sheet. Next. So based on the context in Lebanon, we were able to uh, identify or to create two solutions, one which is the internal kit and the external kit. And I will explain more uh, what's the difference between them. The internal kit is installed uh, in back-to-back -back shelters because of the uh, overcrowdedness of those refugee camps, as I said. So uh, some of the uh, shelters are back-to-back. -back. So we had to split uh, uh, those uh, uh, two shelters that have a back-to-back -back wall and install the fire breaker or the fire barrier between those uh, uh, two shelters. Through experience, yes, we encountered some challenges in terms of uh, leakage of water uh, and other uh, challenges in uh, accepting acceptance from uh, uh, the community, as well as convincing them that those solutions should not be, uh, they should not uh, uh, do a hole uh, for a window or they, they should use them as, as they are. So the benefit of the type one is the fire retardant because for sure it will delay the fire from a tank to another. It will increase the priority uh, between the tanks because some of the tanks were only uh, uh, divided by a plastic sheet. And uh, it, it proved it, it showed, uh, uh, success in terms of soundproof which create more uh, 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 privacy between uh, the, the household. Next slide, please. So as you can see in this drawing, the, uh, the fire barrier is installed between the two tanks. We should ensure uh, the, uh, the, the water leakage uh, is not going to happen. So that's why we're going to use the uh, L-frame to ensure that leakage is not happening. And we're using the, the, the silicon to ensure no leakage uh, in the tanks. And we, uh, if there is any need, we improve the scope of the tanks to ensure water is not going to be two minutes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Next slide. So the so first, let's, let's keep this slide because it's interesting uh, technically. So uh, the, it consists of a layer of the uh, of the of the uh, of the plywood uh, inside of the rock wood, and then another layer of uh, the plywood. Next slide. I'm not going to go into the detail of the rock wool itself, uh, but I'm going to show you the second, uh, next slide please, the second type. So this is, those are pictures from uh, the uh, internal fire barrier that has been installed uh, internally. Next slide. Joanna, can I ask you to, to make your uh, audio please? The second type is the, uh, it has been installed for shelter with a distance up to eight centimeters because we have differentiated between fire breaker and fire barrier. So fire breaker is the physical distance. And now we're calling the this component or this initiative the fire barrier. So the breaker is the physical distance. So any shelter within a distance of 80 centimeters between uh, the shelter and its uh, uh, neighbor shelter, we're installing this type of, uh, of fire uh, barrier. It has the same benefit. Uh, it is fire retardant, uh, increased privacy and soundproof uh, insulation. Next slide, please. So this is the difference and this is how uh, it's being uh, installed. So we're going to see picture from the field. Next slide, now, please. More. Perfect. More. So this is yeah, just let's see this one. This is one of our success stories, uh, and that pushed us to 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 maintain this project and work hard on installing it. So those are two tanks, and you can see how uh, the uh, the fire barrier uh, stopped 
the, the fire from uh, from being transferred to the other tank. And the refugees and the community committee that were trained on fire extinguishers and how to uh, like turn off the fire, uh, respond in a, in a fast way to uh, to save the camp from uh, and the fire from uh, from spreading. That's it. Sorry for being uh, so fast. Uh, I think now we we'll have time for questions now. Thank you so much, Mazin. I this was an amazing presentation. I think fire tends to be one of the biggest risks. I'll wait if anyone else has any questions. If not, then I can go on. Can we ask Fiona, please? To, to yes, thank you. Sorry, I can't see the chat link. Any anyone any questions? You can unmute or you can use the chat to share. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. I've, Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask about, I, yeah, I suppose, and towards the, the end of your talk, particularly you've talked about these, the kind of several different ways of mitigating the effect of fire in terms of firefighting equipment, in terms of these barriers, in terms of separation, in terms of, um, I, I suppose there's potential for, for kind of, improving the wire, the the poor wiring and things that you you know trying to reduce the causes i wondered if, if you had a comment on the kind of relative costs of those different kind of measures how do these how how affordable has it been to do these walls and how does it compare to instead i don't know trying to increase separation between units and things like that yes um uh, i I don't have the numbers right now, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, the latest now with the inflation, the, the, the change in price, I think the cost of one kit is around uh, something around $500 and it can uh, serve for two households. Uh, during our intervention, we do, uh, we do awareness on firefighting and we ensure, because one of the main uh, uh, challenges is the, uh, the usage of whole tires they put them on the roof of their uh, of their tents, which causes more and more uh, risk of uh, fire because it's of uh, caoutchouc. So during the fire awareness phase and the awareness phase, we we ensure, as you said, that uh, the other risks that exist, like the tires, they are being uh, removed. They are replaced by sandbags. Uh, we do the uh, distribution of fire extinguisher. Uh, we train committees on response. We train them on how to respond, which tank to be, uh, because sometimes we ask them to destroy the third tank to ensure that uh, they are more safe and they're mitigating the risk of, uh, of, uh, of the fire being uh, transferred. Concerning the fire uh, barrier itself, the cost is around, as I said, 500 per kit, uh, and the installation is being done through uh, contractors. Currently, we're training the Red Cross and two other organization which are willing to uh, install it through uh, community engagement, which is a, a very good idea. But at some place, it would require the uh, availability of uh, a technical person, because as I said, it might risk uh, the increase of water leakage, uh, because you're, you're trying to, to adapt within the, the tank. And we don't want to fall in this track because the, the community will reject the solution if uh, if the trend becomes that this fire barrier would, would create a leakage, which is not the case. Thank you. That's and so just for I'm I'm not, uh, you know I'm not I'm not working in this field. How so five hundred five hundred dollars for for this solution? How does that like how much does a unit cost? How much does it cost to build a unit? How does that compare? You mean the the shelter unit? Yeah. Uh, not not that much, but the the problem is that no permanent solution is allowed. So, I I do understand that you might say that maybe installing other type of of, of shelter, like placing plastic sheets and wood by uh, prefabs, would be an alternative solution, and not putting the fire barrier. But in our context, this is not allowed by the government. So the only allowable uh, solution is it should be a, a a temporary one using yeah. plastic sheets and uh, and uh, and wood and you can imagine throughout the, the 10 past years uh, the layers of plastic sheets that they have found. sometimes they replace them sometimes they put more sometimes they try to put blankets to ensure insulation so 
everything that is surrounding this family is uh, can 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 put can catch fire at any at any point. But I do understand your point that there are alternative solutions in other contexts. In our specific context, this solution should be a, a temporary one. Yeah. Uh, so so that, I suppose you know, that means it's reusable as well. Potentially, you could move these fire breaks around to to different sites or things. Could you? They can be they can be removed and uh, reassembled in another place. But the uh, we do not notice that much of uh, a movement between the, the refugee camps. Sometimes seasonal, a few specific refugee camps because they seek to go to, to work. But mainly those uh, camps are uh, are there since uh, since ten years now. They are right. fixed, there, but not formal, unfortunately. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry, I feel like I've taken too much time, but that was really interesting. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think uh, we can continue to use the chat box. If anyone has any further questions, we can uh, start there. I will move on to, sorry, I'll move on to the next presentation uh, by uh, Malal. She's going to be discussing exposure and vulnerability of traditional houses in rural Madagascar to cyclones in the face of climate change. Uh, let me just start sharing, uh, check audio. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yes. And here? Uh, yes, we can. And I'll uh, start the screen share and your presentation. Off you go. Okay, thank you, Sneha. Uh, so, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Malalatina Rakutuafuni. I am from Conservation International Madagascar. And I am pleased to present you today some of the preliminary results of our research work in the project RC3 entitled Exposure and Vulnerability of Traditional Houses in Rural Madagascar to Cyclones in the Face of Climate Change. Next slide, please. So let's begin with a brief context. Madagascar is the third most physically vulnerable country in the world regarding the impacts of climate change. And it is one of the bottom four countries in Africa for its social vulnerability, and also the most at risk to cyclones in Africa. And traditional houses, which account for 85% of houses in Madagascar, are regularly affected by cyclones. And this leads to considerable loss of human life and economic loss. Next slide, please. So RC3 is an interdisciplinary project bringing together engineers, climate scientists, experts in disaster risk management and conservationists to understand and address the vulnerability of Malagasy communities and their traditional houses to cyclones. So this is a consortium of uh, university, University of Edinburgh, Liverpool, Johns Morse University, Massin de Miliro, uh, Science and Technology University from Kenya and Conservation International and Numachis from Madagascar. So this project aims to quantify the current level of risk to the communities, investigate how it is likely to change with climate change context, and finally provide information to help target future interventions. Next slide, please. So part of these objectives, we assess the risk of the traditional houses of Madagascar using the conceptualization of risk from IPCC 2014, which states that risk is a function of hazards and vulnerability, which itself a function of sensitivity and adaptive capacity. So for the hazards, we examined whether the number of cyclones affecting the country per year and their wind speed has changed. So we looked at time series of annual wind speed and wind gust speeds and investigated whether there are trends in those. For the sensitivity, we surveyed traditional wooden houses to see their technical aspects of construction, 
After that, we carried out resistance tests on the key elements that we had detected as being weak. And for the adaptive capacity, we first conducted a literature review to identify the determinants and indicators of adaptive capacity relevant to our study. And based on these indicators, we collected data through household surveys and census data. Next slide, please. So this uh, map shows our survey sets, including two highland sets um, in the middle and uh, one coastal site in the right. Next slide, please. So let's turn on to the results. First about the hazards, the figure to the left depicts areas most exposed to high wind gust speeds over Madagascar using the ERA-5 data, data set. And we can see that the Eastern part is the most exposed to the strong wind. And uh, the graph at the top right confirms that an increase in the annual maximum wind gust speed in the northeast part of Madagascar is recorded and which is statistically significant using the Mankendal test at the 95% confidence level. And uh, finally, the, fig the figure on the bottom right is an illust illustration that shows us that the sea surface temperature in the eastern part of the country during the cyclone season tends to rise and this increase in temperature can exacerbate Madagascar's exposure to more frequent and stronger cyclones. Next slide, please. So for the results related to the sensitivity of traditional houses, the survey suggests that houses are self-built using timber elements wooden elements based on local uh, sustainable building practices and using low or no cost materials collected from nearby areas or forests. And this reflects the high vulnerability of those houses. And key elements that should guarantee the resistance of those houses have been detected. And the examples we show here are the types of connections and the embedment of the piles. So we carried out tests on those uh, elements and the results showed that the connection used by the communities to link the different parts of the houses are weak, as you can see on the photos in the right border, in the right uh, side of the slides. And, uh, also, furthermore, the 50 centimeter embedding of the piles, which is the common practice of the local communities as well, does not guarantee the stability of the house. And uh, a sinking of uh, 100 centimeter is more suggested. Next slide, please. So about the adaptive capacity results, following the literature review, we identified several determinants and selected some for our study, including the human resources, the economic wealth, the governance and policy, technology and technical skills, and knowledge and information. Next slide, please. We have also selected some indicators related to each of the determinants. And um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I don't know if the class are very clear, but let me explain a little bit. So for the data, we compared the adaptive capacity between highland and coastal areas. So the higher the right, the higher the adaptive capacity of the area. So the graph shows that for human resources determinants, highland communities have greater capacity than those in coastal areas. In the figure on the right, for example, all human resources indicators, the rate is higher for the highlands in blue and gray, 
than for the coastal areas in yellow and orange. For economical, economic wealth, Highland areas have greater adaptive capacity than those in coastal areas. And in the figure on the right, on the left, sorry, you can see that there are many people in employment in the highlands than in the coastal areas. For the governance and policy determinant, both highland and coastal communities have low adaptive capacity because not all respondents have followed a guide to build cyclone resilient houses. For the technology and technical skills determinant, you can see the graph on the left, both highland and coastal communities have low adaptive capacity, although coastal communities have a slight advantage because most people tend to reinforce their houses before a cyclone hits. And finally, for the knowledge and information determinants, the graph on the left shows a high degree of adaptive capacity for both zones in terms of information for the arrival of cyclones, but in terms of training on resilient house construction techniques, both area have a low adaptive capacity because none of the communities follow any standards. Next slide, please. Manal, so, we are running out of time. Sorry. Sorry? We are running out of time. It's 10 minutes. Maybe okay, okay. Uh, okay, you just did one minute if you, yeah, if you don't sure. mind. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah sure. thank you. So in brief, local, uh, yeah, you can pass to the next slide. Okay, so to summarize, Madagascar is a, at high risk in terms of vulnerability of traditional infrastructure, and coastal areas are more vulnerable. Strong winds in coastal areas than in highlands. Local building practices for vulnerable houses in coastal areas, and local communities more vulnerable in coastal areas. So with climate change, there is a likelihood of increased risk of more frequent and or more intense cyclones. So potentially many more areas affected. So that's why it is important to improve the residence of those traditional infrastructure. And in this sense, the RC3 project plan to combine structural, climatic and social models to develop a probabilistic model to predict current and future resilience, and to engage with NGOs and other stakeholders to co-produce adaptive measures that would increase the resilience of local communities and their traditional houses. With that, I conclude my speech. Thank you for your kind attention. Excuse me. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Others, I would encourage to use the chat, please. I'll stop sharing. If there were no questions, I would like to ask one, uh, if that's okay. Uh, just in terms of like, um, so since you have uh, done this uh, mapping, what would you recommend uh, in terms of like interventions, be it on providing in kit or uh, training or behavioral, uh, and how should it be different for both the coastal and for the highlands? Okay, so I, I think in terms of training, we, we, we already have a, a, an organism who work on it. Uh, this is called the CPGU, and uh, they have uh, done uh, mainly uh, dissemination of uh, guidelines about uh, resistant cyclone uh, houses. And uh, yes, but uh, mainly people doesn't, don't don't follow the guides because uh, their economic wealth, it means that um, it is really difficult to, to buy all the, all the materials to, to build the resilient second houses. Yeah, and you have another question or? I think uh, there is uh, one on the chat as well. We have two more minutes, so we can take this one. Liz is asking, uh, say the children is doing uh, reconstruction of schools, 
damaged by cyclone? Is there any work being done to review the school design? Uh, and not for the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you um, very much. Thank you so much, Manal. We will move on to the next one. Um, we have a presentation by Farhat on female construction uh, group initiative in the Rohingya camp. I will just refresh my slides once again and start sharing my screen. Um, Farhat, are you able to speak uh, audio test? Audio test? Uh, can you say something? I'm not sure. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah. I think there will be a little bit echo because I have sh we have shifted to a new office. We still don't have any furniture, so please excuse. Okay. So I will give out a message at eight minutes. Um, but um, we can start. Sure. Hello, everyone. So today I will be during a shelter intervention we did uh, with Save the Children uh, in Cox's Bazaar. So currently I'm working with Save the Children in Cox's Bazaar Rohingya Response and this is a little initiative we have done at the started at the end of 2021 and it's still ongoing. It's female construction group initiative in Rohingya camp. So let me give you a background first about it. So this is like first ever all female construction group in Rohingya camp. And basically these women are trained to construct shelter. Uh, before this intervention, uh, there were other organizations who tried to build a group out of women, but somehow it didn't work that much. But this was the first attempt where we took this initiative and eventually we ended up making a power pack group of women who are able to construct shelter by their own. Next slide, please. So uh, before the construction scenario of the women group, uh, we even other organizations also used to engage female in cash for work activities, but those were not some sort of work which can grow their shape. Basically in the name of construction, uh, the, we always used to give the lightweight work like passing one brick to another or maybe distributing water during construction works. And we had uh, noticed that eventually when at the same time for cash for work activities, when we engage both male and female, after two or three months, the male group basically gained some skill, which eventually they use in other projects as well and earn through it. But for the female group, for this sort of light work activity, these eventually do not help them to increase any sort of skill with which they can even also try to earn in other projects. So basically from this point of view, we started thinking that why not we engage them into some fruitful activities which can help their livelihood. Even the project ends, they can engage themselves somewhere else. Next slide, please. So our main objective was to encourage effective participation of women in construction because we wanted to build a strong female construction group and positive impact in the community because in the Rohingya response, uh, due to some cultural and religious issues, women are not that much encouraged to work uh, outside. Uh, rather than maybe with some very little livelihood activities inside the house, but they are not encouraged to do this sort of heavyweight work in, in the society. But we realized that uh, to grow an ownership towards their shelter, it's also needed to let them work with the shelter construction so that in future, if even they face any sort of disaster or anything, they can take care of their shelter by their own. And they can also engage themselves in livelihood activities so they can earn. So these were the uh, intention we had before starting this group. And also we wanted to practice present a visible gender mainstreaming in shelter intervention works. Next slide. So we did a community mobilization to form the group of female construction worker, but we faced some barriers from male headed household. Uh, the male members were not in interested to let their women come out 
from their shelter and work for the construction work. But we got a massive positive response from the female headed household. They willingly came to us. Uh, they wanted to take the training and they wanted to work with us. Basically here, female headed household means that the women who are, who are divorced, who are single mother or widows. So, so yes, they, they run their family on their own. So that's why they came forward willingly and they wanted to work with us. Next slide, please. Okay, so at the beginning, we prepared our women group with child safeguarding orientation, PACA, and because of the religious and color issues, we promised them we will give them a separate uh, workshop where only they will be working and one elderly uh, con construction person with expert in shelter construction will be allowed to go to train them up. And we also assigned one female shelter officer for them uh, for the overall training session. Next slide. So here you can see two photos where we have provided, uh, provided them with a separate working space inside the shed where they are working. And there is only one uh, male member who was allowed to train them up during this training session. Next slide. So first challenge we faced when we wanted to weave a certain pattern of bamboo mat. This is the pattern of bamboo mat which is always encouraged in the construction of the shelter for the wall. And this particular herringbone shape. Can someone mute her? Okay, so this was the particular pattern of bamboo mat, which is very much encouraged to use in the shelter. And this pattern is also really very tough to weave. So all the male members of the team and everyone was really skeptical whether women will be able to weave this, uh, this pattern. So it, this was the very first challenge we faced. Next slide. And our women started taking the tra training session to weave this particular bamboo mat. And eventually we realized that the of their weaving, considered into the weaving of the men's group, both were almost identical. So the first challenge was won very nicely. Next slide. So here you can see that uh, both um, bamboo mats weaved by both our male and female groups and they are nearly identical and in very good form. Next slide. And then the learning period begins. So we started giving them the lessons and change the slide please. So we started uh, giving them the lessons and at some point we, we realized that they all also started working with the men group willingly. And at the beginning of the session, only one male member was out in the workshop. But as time went by, realized that all the other shelter, male shelter officer and even the male shelter workers, they are all working together and learning together. And the initial barrier of that working place was uh, slowly removed and this was a massive change for us because we were very skeptical whether we will be able to make them work together both the male and female group but uh, during training session they actually accepted the presence of the male members and they started working with them willingly next slide So here at the here at the learning process, uh, it, uh, you can see with the pictures that they are uh, taking trainings and working in the field. Next slide. And this one is the first shelter. Um, can you go back? Yeah, this one is the first shelter which was totally constru constructed by our female group. After having the training session, this one is the first example of their work. Next slide. And then the progress went on and they kept constructing one by one shelter in the second, just like a regular job. Next slide. And here you can see they are working with groups with both male and female all together. This is like one of a kind of very first scenario in the camp context. 
So everyone were delighted seeing this change in the camp. And this is our field team for shelter who made the actual work possible by doing the community mobilization and the training session and the development of their skills. Next slide. And at the beginning, when we got some negative response, both from the male headed household and from the community, but seeing their work and seeing them earning, even from the male headed household, uh, the people came to us and requested us to take their female member and train them and engage them in shelter construction work. And from other camp blocks from far away camp area, female group heard about this initiative and they came to us and requesting us to take them with the team as well. So the response was more positive after two months. Next slide. Uh, we are at time, so maybe one minute to summarize. Okay, sure, I'll be quick. So uh, in recent fire response, our women group also, also worked for the uh, fire response shelter in another camp and and then they they also have started working in different camp rather than in their own own area so this was happened uh, with their um, with with their willingness it, it's not like that we have assigned them or something they willingly came to us and they work in other areas as well and sneha you can change the slide there are some pictures as well so there are our women shelter workers. Next slide. These are the team basically. Next slide. And now we have a plan that we will do some more community uh, sensitization in all over the camp. And we will prepare a proper guideline for construction session. Again, one important thing, we need to prepare a guideline for their functional literacy because all of them have never got the proper formal education. So it's really tough to make them understand the measurement and everything. So we are preparing a guideline for their functional literacy. And also like child safeguarding and PSCS session and dearer introduction, green climate initiative. And also we will be planning to give them support in child and age family member care when they will take the training in the, tra in the training centers. So this is our future plan and we are slowly making this to, this happen and from eight women we will be looking to expand the group in 800 women who knows. So th that's all from my part. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for her. This was okay. such a heartwarming presentation. Uh, I will leave, it, uh, leave the floor open if there are any questions. I have many of my own. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, just to get the ball rolling, uh, because we're also tight for time. Uh, yeah. Can you explain, other than the socio-cultural norms and those acting as challenges, uh, even employing Rohingya volunteers was such a huge uh, challenge because of difficulties in making payments to them. So could you, could you say what was the experience and getting so first, first, yeah sure challenge first. was to gather team like to form the team and second challenge was the community people because everyone was shocked but i think it was with basically we started with 11 women but then the number reduced because they shifted to another place in another place so we started working with eight women and main uh, and second problem came when we assigned both the male and female workers in the in the construction site at, at the very first day the male worker basically they were sort of laughing that hi why they are here and why they are working like this and then we arranged a session for the male workers to community sensitization and this was uh, i i will be i will say say that yeah, this was the main challenge after recruiting the trainers but eventually after six or seven days the male workers also started accepting their presence positively because they saw that they are working they are learning and their their skill is really good so this was a slight challenge at the beginning but we overcome yeah. it thank you i think uh, thomas also has a question please could you ask 
Yes, thank you very much. I was just interested in if you, um, well, when I hope that you you run these kind of programs again, you said how skeptical you were about the the female and male workers working together in that stage of, of things. Do you think next time it'll be important to start again with the female workers working separately? Or do you think you could go straight to the the two genders working together and the um with the with the social sensitization stuff that you talked about so already we have two experiences of making them work together one is in our regular program and second in 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 the in the recent fire response so, so in the recent fire response, our women group worked in another block of the camp. And same thing happened there. We sensitized the male group. But when the women started working, they all of a sudden, they, the male group gathered there and, and they basically started laughing. And the women group assured me that I was standing there. And they said, that, don't worry. They will laugh for one day. And from next day, they will be normal. Even this answer was also very surprising for me because they had the realization that by, by habit and by practice, even this can be like sensitized. So I think our next target will be that we will engage other male group will come and know that their friends and their community people are working with their women. So in that case, I, I hope I, I hope it will work. The community will get more sensitized. So yes, in our next venture, we will keep them working together. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I think um, unfortunately this kind of work is probably needed in the UK construction industry as well. You you go to sites and you hardly ever see a, a woman on a construction site, unfortunately. Um, thank you very uh, much. There's one more question by Emma. We. Yeah. Hi, sorry, I can be really Please. quick. Um, but yeah, firstly, I just want to say it's an amazing initiative. Um, yeah, it's great to see work like this happening. Um, so it's absolutely amazing. Um, I, yeah, I just kind of had a quick kind of quick question on a similar topic as well, um, which was kind of, yeah, the engagement with the wider community and how you're maybe looking at doing that forward. Because, um, yeah, I've read a few. I did my dissertation, actually, on the Rohingya context, and I read quite a lot um, talking about kind of the negative view from the wider community when women have been like building things or involved um, and how that can actually lead to like a negative impression of aid in like total um, because it's kind of like this idea that they're changing these norms right on a quite large scale um, so yeah I was wondering kind of a bit more about the process and how you did that how you're going to maybe do that going forward um, but I know you've touched on it already but it's super interesting so uh, can, can you just re repeat in, in a small line your question so I can give some quick <laughs> sorry <laughs> um no it was just how the wider community the engagement with the man in the wider community beyond just maybe the um kind of construction okay, so, uh, about the wider community engagement now our plan is in the Rohingya community the community leader is called maji and their religious community leader is the imam of the mosque so to reach the wider community, we have to convince first the Maji and the Imam of the mosque because this, this is the basic way to reach to widespread community people. And already the blocks, the blocks inside the camp where we have worked with the women, the Maji and Imam have a very positive response. So when we will be expanding the work, so we will gather the multiple Maji and multiple Imam with the previous one who who said yes to this work. And then we will have, be having some larger uh, community mobilization. We, we are planning to have our gender expert from our program, the child protection expert from our program so that it can be a multi-sectoral approach to make this uh, women group work happen in a larger spectrum. Oh, that's amazing, wow. thank you. Yeah, that's really amazing, Parvat. I'm sure there are uh, I think Liz is also has a comment. Um, and but, I uh, can share, we have a video story of it. I yes. can share in the email the link. Uh, so that if you can also can... use the chat box to share the link. Yes, sure. So I'm, I'm just well. give me like one minute. I'll share sure. it and it, it will be great, I guess. It will be more easier than the presentation, I hope. 
Thank you so much. We, we have so much to chat once we finish the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Again, you. discuss across. Thank you, Bharat. Um, we, uh, I'm just, I realize I've been switching the presentation. So continuing to switch, I will request Anna, um, who will be talking about uh, climate change adaptation for housing to increase communities' resilience in the Sula Valley, Honduras. Anna, over to you. I'll Hi. Just, uh, Oh, hi everyone. Um, hi everyone. Um, Anna Pavan. I'm an engineering program associate at Bill Chain. I'm very happy to be here with you today to show you something about our climate change adaptation program for housing that we are implementing in Honduras in the Sula Valley to increase local communities' resilience to flooding. Let's start next, please. So the Sula Valley is an alluvial valley in the northwest next please uh, sorry yeah in the northwest side of the country towards the caribbean region it is very rich in agricultural production and in the industrial manufacturing it generates over 50 percent of the national exports and gives home to over one third of the national population which is concentrated on urban areas of san pedro sula choloma which are the main municipalities but also on a variety of rural and quite remote um, communities which are spread uh, in the old territory. It is crossed by two of the main rivers of the nation, Ulua and Chamalecon, and historically the valley has been characterized to, by ex from experiencing frequent floods with water level up to one, one and a half meters. Local communities have developed resilience and can withstand and support this type of event. Unfortunately, climate change has generated more frequent hurricanes that bring to the area very heavy rains that produce serious floods and uh, inundation to which inhabitants cannot, um, to which inhabitants are incapable actually to manage with all known strategies. In November 2020, two category four hurricanes, Eta and Yota, have produced heavy rains in the area with serious flooding with water level up to three meters. Over four million people have been affected. Uh, over 90,000 houses have been damaged. Over 1,000 have been destroyed. Next, please. So Build Change is implementing a climate change adaptation program, which focuses on increasing housing resilience to flooding in local communities. We do this by strengthening existing houses and add a safe, a safe second story unit that can provide shelter and protection during the increasingly harsh storms and floods that affect the area. The unit, the second story unit we are building is also independent from an energetical point of view, uh, thanks to rainwater harvesting and solar panel installation that can give energy when the main connections fail. Next, please. We, we started thinking about this, this solution based on the evidence from recent events. People were very reluctant to leave their homes. They prefer to um, uh, stay in the roof of the home, wait for the water of the rescues to come. They don't, didn't want to leave the, their house in a, unattended. And sometimes they couldn't because the borders, the river borders that you see, which are raised above ground level, sometimes are too far and they don't have the time to move there. So this project gives them the opportunity to stay uh, by generating a safe solution for them to remain close to their, to their house. Next, please. Uh, but this project goes beyond just saving life and, and make a safer building. We are adopting a more holistic approach and we are implementing solutions that improve quality of lives of, of the occupants. We are generating more space that they can use on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. The structural intervention gives us also the opportunity to intervene on comfort and habitability uh, solutions that improve, for example, lighting, cross ventilation. Next, there is an, another picture. We we are providing some basic functioning as water and electricity, also also in case of an emergency. Next, please. So. What is resilient housing to us? This is the build change way to see. It is a house that is safe, of course. It is locally appropriate. It is healthy and a secure space where to live. It is affordable. It is sustainable and adaptable and scalable to the surrounding environment. 
Um, so we are going beyond making a house safe. This project recognizes that the home is the ultimate protection to families and promotes solution in order to satisfy basic needs such as having access to clean water, rest, having light, fresh air, also in case of an emergency. Next, please. The three most important ingredients and obstacles to obtain safe, resilient solution are people, money, and technology. People, someone, we need to generate the demand. Someone needs to want a safe and resilient house. It's not just from the point of view of the homeowners, it's also from the point of view of the governments. They must lead uh, changes and raising awareness in their community, provide technical support to homeowners, to workforces, and ensure that the policy is designed to meet the challenges that lie ahead. Money. If people do not have money to build a safe and resilient house, they simply will not do so. Government have, can have schemes with subsidies and other type of incentives, but we it's time also to explore alternatives, microfinancial, for example, access or, or parallel schemes that can open the, the, the market to also lower income families. And finally, technology. Right engineering and construction solution must be locally available, widely known and cost competitive. Next, please. Talking about cost very, very briefly, I wanted to, oh, it's not here. I show you later about cost then. I added a slide about this. Um, this project would not exist if we're, we were not in partnership with the Honduran Red Cross, which is the implementation uh, muscle <laughs> on, on field. They have access to all the communities. Their network is very, very dense and they have connection um, in all the communities, remote and uh, more urban where we work. And also we're working with the National University through the um, architectural department. They are part of the core design team and they are developing sustainable and um, a sustainable solution that have a lower impact in the environment and the carbon footprint. We could not do this without our donors, amongst which there is also Airbnb. We are providing subsidies for temporary relocation of families while we're working on the houses. And this actually uh, help us to speed up the, the, the process and make it real and, and doable. Next, please. So the proof of concept is under construction at the moment. We are in two uh, communities in the municipality of uh, Choloma. Uh, yes, two means. Choloma um, community of Lupo Viejo, which you see on my background, it was heavily flooded. And then Potrerio, next please, there is another picture. We are building the second story. We, are, we have finished the, the retrofit of the first story and we are building the second story. Next, this is a project that puts homeowner first. Our homeowners decide the design solution. They decide what they want to do with their space and the space distribution. They receive cash and funds from the Red Cross and the Bill Change to directly contract workmanship. We offer them assistance to make sure that builders that they contract do actually do the job with the quality we expect, but they retain the control over the labor procurement and monitoring during the process. They also receive technical assistance because they participate on a daily basis on activities on, on site. They, they are learning technical solution for good practice in construction, and they are always there. The choice of retrofitting buildings rather than building new is already a way to put homeowner first. Retrofitted houses are improved version of the house they already live in, the house they probably they built originally. So it, it is a way to acknowledge the significance that this the existing house has already for that for that family. Next. Um, through this project also, we are empowering women. Irma Mercedes, Irma Raquera, just two of the homeowners that receive and manage the funds to contract labors. We are creating um, new work. We are stimulating the local um, economy because homeowners contract local workmanship. And also we develop and sustain local work uh, workforce because we are transmitting new technical skills, construction skills that then remain in place and this building can train future building. 
Finally, just to wrap up, next please, we think there is a very strong connection and affinity between this project and several of the commitments of the Climate Charter. As I told you, it was born as a response to uh, evidence-based way of community to respond to heavy floods they don't want to leave but also it is a way to give a solution to adapt to these events that become worse and worse includes collaboration with key stakeholders such as the Honduran Red Cross and the National University and embrace leadership of local actors and community putting first the homeowner Sorry, it is a very quick overview. Um, I just wanted to touch a few, few points. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm here for questions. I have a few data on costs um, in case you would like to, to go through them as well. Um, yeah, if there are any questions. Thank you so much. In case not, I would uh, still encourage everyone to use the chat. Uh, as a moment. Okay, otherwise, um, I'll move on. Oh, just Stefano. Stefano yeah. is here. Yeah, Hi, Stefano, please. Something more about the costs would be interesting to know. Yes, sorry, I, I put a last minute slide, but I want to, if I may share my Green. Let me, could you please let me know if you can see it? And the loading. Loading, yeah, not yeah. yet. Yes, we can see it. Oh, okay. I wanted to show you this because Bill Change has done, has performed um, a cost study. Um, or, this is not just for Honduras, it is over 14 countries, you can see here, and almost over 1,400 buildings that we have either designed for intervention or design and build for intervention. Um, it, it resulted quite clear that the cost of retrofitting buildings is much cheaper than building new. We're talking about 23%. And also if we retrofit to expand, if we intervene the building to expand it to a safe second story, as we are doing in Honduras, it is still much cheaper than building new. We are talking around 35% of retrofit cost of first story to withstand the load coming also from a second one. But also our experience showed that we should go beyond uh, making a building safer. You see there that 57% of the investment goes to mitigation measures and they are to, to retrofit and structural strengthening, but still over 40% is going and the homeowner willing are willing to um, invest them in other type of interventions such as structural repairs, habitability improvements and finishings and, and, and growth of the building. So what I was mentioning before that resilient solution go beyond safety and save life, which are still the main core of, of our intervention. I meant this holistic solution take into consideration all these aspects uh, and homeowner are showing the need and the willing to for all this aspect to be included in the in the solution that we propose to them. Thank you very much, Anna. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. I just can we now want to add anything? Um, they just joined. Sorry. Okay, I'll. I think I'm the last to present today. So without further ado, let me not forget to set time for myself. Otherwise, I could use half an hour. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for your time. It's been such a wonderful panel. I don't know uh, how much I could do justice to both sharing and presenting. Um, I am. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, one second. Thinking what if we integrate that as part of the tool stand so it's more authentic. Sorry, somebody is seven. Okay. Um so I'm going to be uh, briefly describing the context in South Sudan. Uh, although the work it, itself wasn't about shelter, I'm using this study to ask questions about displacement and climate change and then what role can the shelter sector play 
uh, in addressing not just housing need, but also issues about communal infrastructure, issues about integrated approaches to uh, providing response. This was undertaken in uh, light of a project that we did for Christian Aid and partners who were um, providing COVID-19 support uh, in 2021, 2020, 2021. But uh, as most of you all are aware, uh, there were recurring floods in 2020, 19, 20, 21, and communities have been living in prolonged uh, displacement conditions as well as water logging uh, in most of the provinces in Jambra. So uh, just to give a geographical sense of where we are uh, in terms of COVID-19, so Sudan was at very high risk. Uh, but also in terms of vulnerable groups who have been displaced both internally and externally, the challenges were quite heavy. Uh, this, uh, before I usually get into the detail of my presentation, I try to summarize what is it that I want to say in the beginning itself. So if I lose you two minutes down the line, at least you will remember these two things. One is I, uh, the, the first key message that I want to take, want you all to take away is that there, is, there seems to be, uh, on the surface, very limited role that the shelter or housing sector can play, uh, especially in a context like this, when the populations are facing multiple and cascading risks, such as floods, COVID-19, conflict, displacement, uh, and even smaller risks, which they are more concerned about, such as snake bites or waterborne diseases. Um, and to link all of this to climate change would be uh, a traditional study that none of us have the means to undertake, especially within the shelter sector. Uh, so when you have these variable risk perceptions and even inconsistencies within different stakeholders on how to respond and mitigate towards these different uh, risks, uh, what often happens in the absence of any external support, we usually find that communities resort to either adaptive practices or maladaptive practices, which often adversely impact women and children. So, so having said that, now I'll get on to my presentation. So uh, the questions that I'm trying to reflect on with the work that we did is to look at uh, what do we know from COVID-19 and other disaster risk responses, such as floods or internal displacement, food insecurity, how do they impact uh, women and children in remote provinces in South Sudan? Uh, the other question that I would, have, I would want to, us to reflect on is what different approaches seem to work uh, for instance, providing communal infrastructure to address flood safety and other climate risks. And where does shelter fit in terms of uh, our response to human mobility, especially when they are displaced, uh, both internally and externally, for several reasons. Uh, so just to give an overview, some of the information that I would be using is the data that we had collected. Uh, through literature review, through virtual research methods, through focus groups, through household surveys, and interviews uh, with some key experts in South Sudan. Um, there's more details here, but I'm not going to get into much detail. Uh, to give a bit of context about the floods itself, uh, COVID-19, we all are aware about it, so I don't want to focus too much on that. Um, Within Ayut County, there were multiple uh, flood waves uh, in mid-August uh, in 2020 and again in 2021, which led to increasing water levels. Many biomes were actually inaccessible, and even in terms of collecting data, in terms of providing uh, initial response, it was actually quite challenging because people either had to wade through knee-length waters or use canoes, which were very few in numbers. Uh, the most affected uh, locations did seem to be very remote or uh, next to the river. And what happened as a result was not only with the livelihoods disrupted, but access to basic facilities such as education, etc. Everything was getting uh, severely disconnected. Uh, and the concerns about the future, because the waters hadn't receded yet, was also quite high. So in, in this uh, context of uncertainty, uh, how do we understand multiple risks and how do people perceive and what strategies do they come up with? Um, I just wanted to summarize that these were the different uh, uh, 
images that we uh, that our uh, partners in ADA, uh, partners ADA in South Sudan had shared with us. So images of snake bites, uh, of uh, staff having to navigate uh, these pyramids through canoes. And uh, the graph over there gives an indication of how households reported experiencing food shortages in such a context. Uh, so the different hazards, like I was mentioning, there were floods, there was COVID, uh, conflict and displacement, snake bites, food insecurity, and it impacted uh, the community in terms of uh, limiting their mobility, in terms of shutting down of schools, limiting their access to markets, uh, to livelihoods, and also resulting in a lot of distress and uh, issues related to inter-tribal conflicts as well. Uh, and to give uh, to give a bit, bit of a historical sense, most of these uh, communities, these uh, groups used to be pastoral. And over the years, because of uh, degradation of natural resources, they tend to have settled either uh, with their relatives or uh, their friends in, in, in safer neighborhoods where at least they can uh, feel safer. But even here, uh, they continue to face challenges of Floods and like I was describing. Uh, so there, uh, the, the responses that we collected were actually uh, looking at how many people were displaced and where they were living uh, with more than six months or less than six months, and looking at uh, whether they were planning to return back to their uh, houses. I'm short of time, so I'm not going to go into the different adaptive and maladaptive behaviors. Uh, but use uh, this forum to um, present as is uh, some of the local voices that we were trying to capture. Uh, some quotes here actually uh, emphasize what are the risks that the communities were trying to emphasize, uh, mostly in terms of lack of uh, water, clean drinking water facilities to uh, tackle their own menstrual hygiene needs and concerns. Uh, how they were using the cash that was distributed to them. So someone says cash distributed by ADA helped us to buy some food for that month. But after that, there was no organization that supported us. So we tend to eat only one meal a day. Uh, women and uh, young girls were reported to actually wade through these waters to pick water lilies, which was then ground and actually fed to children as the only source of food that was available. Fishing was only possible for families which were living close to the river. Um, so the concerns that they raise is we are more worried about lack of food than we are worried about COVID or anything else. Uh, the weather, and so that also resulted in a lot of misconceptions. Um, We also discussed a lot of uh, challenges that women are facing because of this distress where uh, incidences of uh, abuse and uh, fights inter interpersonally and inter-household and community uh, violence was taking place because everyone was trying to share the limited resources that they have. Um, and uh, some, some of them in uh, these interviews actually do, uh, shared that uh, in the absence of not receiving any shelter support, what the community wanted to prioritize was actually con constructing a dike along the river so that they can protect themselves from floods next year. And uh, the challenge was such that uh, neither the government, or the local uh, district administrations or uh, organizations are in a position to be able to provide even this communal infrastructure for their household and other uh, basic needs uh, for these communities. Um, so to summarize uh, in 10 seconds, uh, like I said, uh, the three things that I want us to take away is in the absence of a clear uh, uh, organization who's addressing different needs uh, for these communities over a long period of time, we find a lot of localized strategies are picked up, which could either be maladaptive and adaptive. Uh, but uh, there is a lack of uh, clear direction from the local governments and traditional leaders as to what are the priorities and how can communities protect themselves from the flood next time. Uh, this means that uh, there is a demand for from the community to build these dikes so that they can protect themselves. But in terms of 
mobilizing other resources which are required for these dikes, the communities are often feeling uh, feeling quite challenged. Uh, in terms of um, shelter recovery programming, I often advocate for integrated approaches. Uh, my research has been on WASH and health, and I try often to see how to uh, addressing the needs of different groups, we are able to actually integrate our response in such a way that we can meet different needs so that we can provide a healthy and safe uh, unit, uh, like a settlement unit, rather than just share housing and shelter. With that, I would like to close my presentation and ask if there are any questions. Sorry for rushing through. Uh, 10 minutes really is not that. I'll just keep my uh, slides to the key messages. Any questions? I think in the main group, there was somebody who was uh, discussing about South Sudan in the chat. I'm not sure if we have them in the group now. Okay, I can, it does, the question doesn't have to be me. Uh, final five minutes for any final thoughts across all the presentations. Any discussions, any reflections that the group would like to share? In terms of future direction, where do we see the sector going? How much is COVID disruptive? Or enabled? I, I believe, in, anyone, sorry. Okay, if there are no further questions, and uh, we could actually uh, wrap up this session and perhaps join the plenary, uh, because I think we ran over time and maybe the sessions would have started after the break. So Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's been my pleasure sharing the session. And thank you so much again to the speakers. Um, wonderful work. I'm so happy to be sharing this one. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank everyone. you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Ah, there's an hour. Thank you, Fiona.